and with the music and other context, which individual worship uh, inhabits with quiet meditation, nor with times when God leads his people to worship him in silence. What do you mean by that? Okay. That paragraph was not in my original draft, but I had to address a challenge that someone gave to me when they reviewed the, the draft about we don't always have to worship with sacred music. And so I was saying, but wait, I'm talking about corporate worship. I'm talking about when we gather together, as you read, as with the saints, the fellowship of the saints of the church, to gather in fellowship, to to worship God. And this is, God commands us to worship in a gathering together. The, what the word corporate means, in, you know, as a group. And uh, he commands that, and the confession of faith re- reflects that. And scriptures that are quoted in the confession of faith that you just read support that. The fellowship of the saints is the church. That is how we are uh, unified as a church. And where Habakkuk chapter 2 comes in is there are times that we can reflect upon in complete silence. And the prophet in Habakkuk was doing that. So the the Lord is in his holy temple is, is when he is lamenting the turmoil that was upon the earth at that time and against God's people, the battles against God's people. But he was assuring us that God was in control in his temple and was in charge. But if you read further in Habakkuk, in chapter three, and I think I footnote of chapter three, Habakkuk, later in the article, the prophet then is uttering a prayer and prays to God saying, God's glory covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. Hmm. At one moment, we are silenced with awe about God and how he, he runs the earth and how he, he loves us. And in the next moment, we are singing with praise. So that is who we are in our humanity. Hmm. Amen. So we know what worship is. You know, it, it's the, the gathering of God's people, praising and singing him. And of course, listening to the preaching of the word, or it could be, you know, in your quiet time studying by yourself. You know, so the next thing is like some of our listeners may not be musically inclined. Some of us cannot sing, i.e. myself. So the next question is, Miss Yvonne, what's so special about singing a cappella? Well, a cappella singing has been around an awfully long time. So that is simply singing without instrumental accompaniment. In the early church, singing was primarily a cappella. The early church, um, the Christians were were trying to keep their worship private and they would they didn't have musical instruments. They would sing a cappella, they would sing the Psalms of David. And in any event, even later, instruments were so primitive, they rarely accompanied singing and worship. In the early Reformed Church, after the Reformers in, reintroduced the concept of congregational singing, there were but repetitive chants where the congregation would repeat what the song leader had just said. And it was primarily a cappella. Later, as musical instruments developed further and there were new ones invented, more and more instruments became being used. But today, even today, we use a cappella during worship service as a means to emphasize our worship. I mean, think about it. The congregation cannot lean upon the musical instrument, the piano, the organ, or the guitar for support during a cappella singing. They must listen to each other. They must think about what they are singing. These times can be truly awesome in worship if you think of it. Yeah, I've I've been to some uh, Christian based events where a cappella was uh was the mo- the form of worship and it is a beautiful thing when you can sing, obviously, but it's a beautiful thing when everybody doesn't care about who's off pitch and, and whatnot is, you know, we're, we're saying the same words and we're expressing our worship to God individually, yet at the same time, corporately. 
you know, you were saying something about the early church not having instruments. I, I know in the African American uh, churches during the, the slavery time, when they were able to have their own type of church, the only type of musical instrument they had was the clapping of their hands and the stomping of their feet, you know, yes. to help them keep tempo. And a, a lot of the old hymns or the old spirituals I grew up on, uh, due to my grandmother, she listened to Mahalia Jackson, you know, Mahalia Jackson's famous for humming and clapping. And then, you know, Shirley Caesar, she's got a couple of her early hits when all she had was her foot and hand, uh, you know, just and, and Albertina Walker and, and people like that, that actually, they embraced the acapella side of singing because that's what they grew up on. You know, me as a young kid listening to this, I'm like, man, that's a different way of, of, uh, you know, worshiping God in a sense of they had no music. They only had their hand, their voice and their foot. <laughs> so exactly. their entire self. And, and right. I am a jazz lover. I love the jazz from the twenties and thirties and forties and fifties. I just love it. And, and I tap in my foot every time I hear that stuff, there are even some anthems and hymns we sing where, you know, they may be spiritual based in the choir you'll I'm one of those that you'll see me swaying in the front of the church. Hey man. <laughs> I just can't help it. It is in me, you know? It just gets in me and I, and I'm going to be moving. See, I understand that because I do love music. I dabble on piano. I was in band. Uh, I actually love singing. I just can't sing. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I get it. When I walk into a Presbyterian church and and I see and look, I'm not bashing my own denomination or anything. But when I walk into a Presbyterian church and I just see a bunch of people standing there frozen, like, for example, singing How Great Thou Art, how can you stand still for that? Like, that's one of those songs like, man, like at that last verse, when it talks about, you know, taking your last breath and you still worshiping God, how great thou art. How can you stand in one spot without swaying? I or, know. You know, or lifting your hands. So I get it. <laughs> I know. And I cannot. And I, I tried to give some feeling of that. I mean, I've told you in our private conversations, I'm a serious person and it's the nature of my profession and uh, I guess of how I'm put together, but, but I am very emotional as well. And I tried to put some of that in the article in the, in the introduction. And at the, at the very end, when I talk about how it feels during, um, you know, Christmas Eve service, when, you're in a, a darkened um, sanctuary. Candles might be lit, yes, yes. and you silent night a cappella. There is no feeling like that. I'm and getting I'm chills. Getting choked, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. Now. Or then to think about at the end when we are all taken up to heaven in triumph, and you're singing the hallelujah chorus. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine nothing else like that yeah I, my favorite uh to sing during christmas time acapella is oh holy night you yes. know because that one i mean I, i'm from a small church and we have one particular window that it's it's a drawing or a painting if you will of the angel appearing to joseph in a dream and singing oh holy night on a crystal clear night in south louisiana in that church looking at that window is like my goodness like the window is speaking to me as I'm singing this song and worshiping God. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm over. I'm, I'm overtaken by the voices in the church when, you know, it doesn't matter. Again, you don't have to be in tune. It, it would be nice, but you don't have to be in tune when you're singing this song. But when you get a person that knows how to sing and does it a cappella, it is by far so captivating and you shouldn't be sitting still in your pew you should be squirming around wanting to join yeah. in with the song and singing with them yes i love music okay what are two consistent arguments about music used in worship i'm going to tell you to reference your article on that question this is kind of where it took off from what i originally had i, I mean you know you write a you write an article you write the first draft the second draft and you know it was probably about a third of the way in to the whole process, I kind of started over. I don't know <laughs> if you've ever done that, but, and part of the reason was this, was because I caught that there are these two common threads, two consistent arguments in all the reading I was doing. 
The first one was that worship music must be sacred. Right. And the second one was that the congregation should sing enthusiastically during worship. And the reason that that was important was some of the articles were about how Christian music developed. Some were arguments why or why not we shouldn't use contemporary music or why or why not we should use bands or why. Or, you know, all these arguments for or against various types of music. And those are minimal issues. Those are like what color should the choir robes be? You know, these are things that are not focused. We should focus on these two arguments. These two arguments are that it should be sacred and the congregation should sing. Right. Amen. You know, I remember we had this uh, this guest preacher that came and his wife uh, obviously tagged along with him and I've become uh, close friends with him and his wife uh, decided she was going to uh, sing for us. And now again, I'm Presbyterian, but I'm African American of descent, if you will. And I happen to attend and I'm not going to call my church stale because we're, we're probably further from stale than most people would think we are, but I'm in a room with a, a bunch of white Americans that may or may not know the style that this lady was going to sing. And the visiting pastor was a black pastor. So obviously, and I'm not being stereotypical, but you know, majority black people have the gospel feel uh, when they sing or, or the gospel background when they sing. And she started singing and I kid you not, it was the gospel style. Um, we have an autistic kid in our church who absolutely loves music, loves singing. I believe if he could speak, he would probably be a singer. But she started singing and I'm, I'm like looking around like, oh, my goodness, how is the church going to accept this? Because I know I, I'm OK with it. But how are the how are they going to accept that? And I worry about that sometimes. You know, I went to I think it was General Assembly last year or maybe year before last, maybe both of them, where the. No, it was last year where the worship leader apologized for his style of worship. And I'm like, what are you apologizing for that? It, you know, you're not over the top. It, it is a bigger church. You know, you, you have the means to to have a full ensemble, if you will. What are you apologizing for? I agree with you uh, that, you know, we, we shouldn't be apologizing let me, let me tell you an experience I had as, as a choir member. I was um, attending a very large church in Memphis at the time. And we had a choir of somewhere at its, at its height of somewhere between 75 and 100 members in the choir. Hmm. And we did a pul what they called a pulpit exchange with an African-American church in Memphis. Okay. And they were likewise equally as large. So our pastor and choir went to the African-American church for a service. Their pastor and choir came to our church. And they were, just, we're not this, you know, we, we exchanged, so we were able to attend both. I mean, they weren't at the same time. So I was fortunate to be in the choir. At the time. I'm telling you, just the environment of that church was inspirational to us. We probably sang some of our best. Our preacher, <laughs> our preacher, who was very much a reformed Presbyterian, very, very straight, very organized, very cultured, chose his words very carefully. He was filled with the spirit during his preaching like I'd never heard before. And it was such an experience, something I would not I would not take back from either one of the congregations at that time. And likewise, when they came to uh, the white, primarily church to fill our pulpit and our choir loft, it was also a very inspirational service. So yeah. no apologies either way. I think everyone, including the congregation, was fulfilled during those. Events. Right. And then another thing that I hear, and, and I do somewhat agree with this, some of the music that is produced isn't biblically correct. Okay, so I am all about it, you know, making sure it's correct music. But you have some of those black gospel songs that they're not incorrect biblically, but they don't line up with our doctrine. 
and you'll get people saying, oh, you shouldn't sing that in church. You know, like, for example, uh, one of the songs that 